Yeah, so thanks everybody for inviting me to present today. Uh, if you only gave me one word to summarize the American Revolution, I would have to say freedom. And not only does the word freedom characterize the American Revolution, but it also characterizes this great and wonderful country that is the United States today. I'm an American, and maybe there's some other Americans here today with us, and we can explain in all the wonderful ways in which we're free. For example, we're free to choose our own health insurance company. Uh, we can choose the name of that company that's going to screw us over um, every day and make, give us hell of bureaucracy and paperwork if we get sick. Um, and the health insurance company is also free to charge whatever they want to you. Uh, we're free to choose which bank to get a credit card from, which bank will give us student loans or a mortgage, which will put us into debt for the rest of our lives. Um, and it's a great freedom to go into unending debt. It's actually an American tradition that started during the revolution. Um, so yeah, if you only gave me one word to summarize the American Revolution, I would say freedom. But if you gave me four words, I would say freedom for the rich. Um, but you gave me a few more words than that. So, uh, yeah, the subtitle of, event, of this event is a Marxist analysis. And Marxist analysis of history is kind of unique to Americans. Um, and that's because Marxists, as historical and dialectical materialists, seek to delve beneath the surface of events and to unravel and understand their inner contradictions. Um, but more popular methods of analyzing history uh, are kind of common in America. And so on the one hand, you have like memorization-based history, uh, which we're taught in high school, like an AP US history class, uh, where it's just a series of isolated facts that you have to memorize. Oh yeah, American Revolution, well that's the Stamp Act, and the Boston Tea Party, Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War, Battle of Bunker Hill, Hamilton, and then they might start singing or something. Um, and so for the, most of that case, uh, history is taught as uninteresting and dry as possible, or just through song. Um, on the other hand, you have like idealist kind of history. And you have brilliant, wonderful movies like National Treasure with Nick Cage, uh, where the plot is literally that the Freemasons instigated the revolution to keep the secret treasure of the Knights Templar from the British. That was like the whole reason behind the revolution. Um, and that, in fact, there's an invisible map on the back of the Declaration of Independence, which points to a treasure being buried under a church on Wall Street. Um, but there's also people who have a genuine idealist approach to history, and they take themselves quite seriously. Um, these are true American patriots uh, like Rush Limbaugh or Bill O'Reilly from Fox News, uh, people like the far right wing of the Republicans or the Tea Party. Um, they have many ridiculous books. Uh, for example, there's one by Bill O'Reilly called Killing England, the Brutal Struggle for American Independence. Uh, Rush Limbaugh has one called, um, where he literally writes it as if he was there taking part in America's historical events. And you see him say how like these 17th and 18th century pilgrims argue why socialism is against human nature. Um, it's called Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims, Time Traveling Adventures with Exceptional Americans. Wonderful book. Um, but yeah, so what I'm going to be presenting today is a Marxist analysis of the American Revolution. Um, my goal is going to be to explain the fundamental forces, processes, and class struggles that motivated and drove the revolution. Uh, we're going to look at real facts, yes. We're not just going to try to memorize a list of things. But really, the focus is going to be understanding why did it happen, um, what were the social forces involved, and then what happened afterwards. And then we'll seek to start to derive conclusions and think about how maybe it's relevant for today. Um, so yeah, until the Declaration uh, of Independence, which happened in 1776, uh, this country, which would become the United States of America, was divided into 13 colonies. All of those colonies belonged to Great Britain, uh, which was the most powerful and far-reaching imperial force on the planet at the time. And these 13 colonies had humble beginnings, from less than 2,000 people in 1625 to over 2 million in 1776. Of course, when counting the population, the British did not consider the people who already lived in the Americas, the indigenous people, as actual 
people. And while today the focus uh, is not going to be on uh, the indigenous struggle and the history of that, um, it deserves its own presentation, absolutely. Um, it should be noted, right, that the entire history of this so-called new world, uh, which was not very new for the people who already lived here, uh, it's a history of nonstop violence, uh, treachery, and genocide on beha behalf of the coloners, uh, colonizers. Um, Marx explained in Capital that the colonization of the New World was a pivotal moment in the period of the primitive accumulation, this first accumulation of capital, uh, and that capitalism came into being with blood dripping from every pore. And so, yeah, the, the rich European colonizers and trade companies planted the seeds for a new group of local rich property owners to emerge within the 13 colonies. Uh, the owners of the plantations in the south to the rising industrial capitalists in the north. All of these people amassed a mount mountains of wealth, either from slavery, by seizing native lands, or by exploiting the poor indentured servants from Europe, or just by doing all three of those things. Um, and so, yeah, these colonial elites, uh, maybe Bill O'Reilly would call them hardworking Americans, are people we would call the national bourgeoisie. Uh, and they were incredibly wealthy by the time of the revolution. In 1770, the top 5% of Boston taxpayers owned 49% of the wealth. Um, that's my bad Bernie Sanders accent. Um, while the lowest 30% of taxpayers owned no property at all. Um, and in the colonies as a whole, the top 10% of the white male population, which of course was a way smaller than the whole population, um, they owned, that top 10% just of the white male population owned nearly half of all the wealth in the colonies. And 60% of all of the slaves who made up a quarter of the entire population. Um, and at the same time, even the lower classes were in a state of almost constant rage. In the 1750s and 60s, there were tenant uprisings and riots in New Jersey and New York in the Hudson Valley. Uh, there were rebellions in the 1760s by the Green Mountain Boys in eastern New York, which eventually led to the recognition of Vermont as a separate state. And there was also the Regulator Movement, uh, where thousands of poor farmers in South Carolina band together with arms in order to prevent the collection of debts and taxes by the colonial government. They actually raided the prisons and released debtors and took over and ended the proceedings of county courts. Uh, they forced the judge to flee town and they beat up all the lawyers. And then they looted the stores uh, because of the relentless debt that the colonial government was putting them in. Eventually, these people were all uh, hanged. But in general, the contradiction in the colonies was one between the rich colonial owners on the one hand and the propertyless majority, most of whom were in debt or poor or extremely pissed off or all of the above. And this national bourgeoisie realized that they would not benefit from this open conflict with the lower classes. They didn't like having constant riots and rebellions. And so they needed something that could redirect this animosity, something to unite the propertyed and the propertyless Americans under a common cause by fighting a common enemy called Great Britain. <clears throat> and so after Great Britain won the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, in 1763, uh, the colonies began to realize that British protection was kind of no longer necessary. Um, the French were gone, and the so-called Indians were kept at bay due to the proclamation of 1763, which the British signed, which said anything west of the Appalachian Mountains was out of bounds for the colonists. Uh, but the British state uh, had a different perspective. Uh, they said the colonies have to pay back the crown for the expenses of the war, and in fact, they should be grateful for the king's de divine benevolence. Um, with France defeated from that war, the crown could focus on really squeezing every last shilling out of the colonies. Uh, for example, the Stamp Act of 1765 required every document, license, contract, newspaper, pamphlet, pack of playing cards to carry a British stamp. And this really pissed people off. It resulted in a lot of turmoil. For example, there was one angry mob in Boston uh, led by none other than the great shoemaker Ebenezer McIntosh. Nobody knows who that is. Um, he, they armed themselves with axes and torches and destroyed the house of a rich British capitalist, and they stole of his wine. And these incredibly frustrated lower classes did not act entirely on their own. 
uh, there was a radical revolutionary group called the Sons of Liberty, with Samuel Adams at its head, uh, which was constantly at work in the colonies attempting to inspire action against Great Britain. Uh, these people were kind of like the revolutionaries of Les Miserables, thank you, uh, but more successful. Uh, they tended to be in the middle classes, so they weren't rich bankers or pro uh, plantation owners, but they certainly weren't poor or propertyless. The Sons of Liberty, uh, they were folks like mid-level artisans or tailors or blacksmiths uh, or small-scale merchants. Maybe they were smugglers, lawyers or doctors. In general, they were the petite bourgeoisie. But really, essentially, this, this group was a vanguard org organization that tried to provide revolutionary leadership to the lower classes in order to overthrow the domination of an oppressive empire and the rich elites in Britain. Um, they were hated by the conservative wing of the national bourgeoisie, uh, people like George Washington and John Adams, who is Sam Adams' cousin, um, because these super rich uh, colonial national bourgeoisie, uh, they feared that the, these movements would get out of hand and that sooner the Sons of Liberty might stop, not stop at the British elites, but might also start targeting the colonial elites themselves. Um, but the Sons of Liberty had quite radical tactics. Um, one thing they were famous for was this thing called a tar and feathering, uh, which if you're not familiar with that, um, they would do this to tax collectors. Everybody hated the tax collectors there. Uh, and the Sons of Liberty wanted to intimidate them from ever collecting taxes again, right? And so to, to intimidate them, they would like strip them naked and dump burning hot tar all over their body and then dump a bunch of feathers all over them and make them run around <laughs> like a chicken. And so either they'd be humiliated or they would just, and tortured, or they would just die from their skin being <laughs> melted off. So pretty brutal tactics, uh, quite militant uh, to say the least. Um, and they led many angry protests and riots, but they did try to limit them from going too far. Uh, to quote Sam Adams, he gave words of warning to the masses after another law was passed by the British, uh, worse than the Stamp Act. Uh, he said, no mobs or tumults, let the persons and properties of your most inveterate enemies be safe. Which seems kind of at odds to like tar and feathering, but um, and also at odds to the fact that they led this massive direct action very soon after that called the Boston Tea Party uh, in 1773, where they dumped over 600,000 pounds of British tea into the Boston Harbor. And this was in response to a new tax law by Britain, uh, which let the East India Company sell a bunch of tea without paying taxes, undercutting the local merchants. So the goal of the Sons of Liberty was to inspire revolutionary energy for a struggle against Great Britain. But why were these middle classes, this petty bourgeoisie, so insistent on revolting against Great Britain in the first place? Why would the rich colonial elites and the national bourgeoisie eventually join the call for revolution? Well, this was a time of unrest. People were in a state of ferment and they felt incredible discontent. Um, but really, this political unrest was a reflection of the underlying economic situation, right? What Marxists would call the objective material conditions at the time. That is to say, the merchants, the landowners, the capitalists, the American national bourgeoisie were really, they were unable to fully develop their businesses and their industries due to the taxes and burdens imposed by the British Empire. And so it's, it is true to say that the, the, the constant taxes, ever raising duties and fees, um, to pay to the crown, for that they were forced to pay to the crown, they limited the free development of capitalism. So it was only a bourgeois, a capitalist revolution that could actually break the chains of British domination and allow for capitalism to develop freely. And so what was needed was a profound and social revolution uh, which would root out the remaining traces of monarchic rule and feudalism inherited from the only partially complete English revolution uh, without Cromwell. And so while well, in the beginning of colonization, it was necessary for Great Britain to own and control the colonies uh, and invest in them, this political form eventually turned into its opposite, where the British colonial uh, rule no longer provided an impulse to development, but became a fetter on development. Um, how much time do we have? Okay, yeah. So as Marx outlined in his famous contribution to the critique of political economy, 
He says, at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, with the property relations within the framework of which they've operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters. Thus begins an era of social revolution. The changes in the economic foundation sooner or later lead to a transformation in the whole immense superstructure. And so the changing economic foundation for away from this colonial subjugation to full unhindered capitalism actually required a revolution. And this revolution liberated the capitalists, the American national bourgeoisie, from the shackles of Great Britain. And it gave them free rule to rule society in their interests and do whatever they wanted. And so the national bourgeoisie eventually kind of realized this. Um, they realized their collective interests uh, and that they must break free from Britain and establish their own nation state in order to have economic and political independence. So Thomas Paine, uh, who wrote this famous pamphlet called Common Sense in the beginning of 1776, he spoke for this revolutionary bourgeois class. He, he would talk about how the divine right of kings and the hereditary passing of the throne was an utterly terrible form of government. Uh, I'm quoting from Common Sense. And remember, this was written in the 1700s. He said, one of the strongest natural proofs of the folly of hereditary rights in kings is that nature disapproves of it. Otherwise, she would not so frequently turn it into ridicule, giving mankind an ass for a lion, which is like a big mic drop, like this. Basically, he's talking shit about how incompetent the kings are, um, giving, it, giving an ass instead of a lion, like a donkey. Um, but more importantly, uh, he realized the economic interests of the bourgeoisie, uh, and he expresses these in this text. He says, I challenge the warmest advocate for reconciliation to show a single advantage that this continent can reap by being connected with Great Britain. I repeat the challenge. Not a single advantage is derived. Our corn will fetch its price in any market in Europe, and our imported goods must be paid for by them where we decide. So his pamphlet sold hundreds of thousands of copies and went through 25 editions just in one year in 1776. The masses were thirsty for these revolutionary ideas. In this cycle where more pamphlets would get produced and more people would read them and get inspired, and then they would spread the ideas and then they'd look for more and they'd read any revolutionary literature they could find that they could get their hands on. And so really this is a clear example of the need and the role for a revolutionary press to spread revolutionary ideas and unify the struggle nationally. You know, it says it right on my shirt. Without revolutionary theory, there will be no revolutionary movement. And Thomas Paine really did provide quite a bit of revolutionary theory for the movement at that time. Um, and even then, though, he was kind of reacting to a movement that was already going on under their, under their eyes. Uh, the Sons of Liberty would foster and encourage the creation of these things called committees of correspondence for the revolutionary mov movement. Uh, Sam Adams wrote in 1772 in the Boston Gazette, it's high time for the people of this country explicitly to declare whether they will be free men or slaves. Of course, he's not talking about the actual slaves, speak, in which I'll talk about later. Um, he said, he's referring to <laughs> the capitalists who have to pay taxes to Britain, uh, but he says, let us calmly look around uh, us to consider what is best to be done. Let it be the topic of conversation in every social club. Let every town assemble and let associations and combinations be everywhere set up to consult and recover our just rights. And so these committees of correspondence were revolutionary organizations. They spread information, they organized demonstrations and actions like boycotting British goods, uh, and they'd enforce these rules. And when, if word got around that people weren't following the rules of the committee, uh, they would use force against them. They might use militias to enforce their rules and maybe even tar and featherings to get people um, in line. And especially they would uh, uh, use tar and featherings and such tactics against the loyalists people who supported Britain. Um, but really, these revolutionaries were kind of establishing a new basis of government. They created a situation with elements of what Marxists would describe as dual power. And so while the British colonial governments claimed authority, these committees actually had the authority of the people. And the people listened to the committees and what the committee said went, not what the colonial government said. And so really, this starts to beg the question, well, who is the government? Who actually has the power and who runs society? 
Uh, and this culminated in the Maryland Committee of Correspondence calling for the first Continental Congress in 1774, which eventually led to the second Continental Congress the following year, where the Declaration of Independence was signed on the 4th of July, 1776. Um, so yeah, the Declaration of Independence. It proposed quite radical ideas for the time. It said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, originally, it was going to say and property, but Thomas Jefferson said, no, 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 let's say pursuit of happiness instead. Uh, <laughs> which part of me wonders is like, well, maybe it's because they didn't want people to think they were actually allowed to own property, since most people didn't own any property. Um, but really, you know, even this idea was quite revolutionary at the time, and we can't dismiss it. Uh, the idea that in 1776 that at least some men uh, are in theory equal was kind of radical. It meant that the kings who ruled Europe uh, shouldn't have the divine right to rule. Uh, the idea that people actually had rights at all, um, that people could decide for themselves how to govern without a god who was just telling them what to do through the voice of a king, uh, it was a pretty new idea for the time. Um, so yeah, the Declaration of Independence, it was a very revolutionary document with very revolutionary words, uh, but it certainly would have been more revolutionary if the words corresponded <coughs> to reality. Um, unfortunately, this all men were created equal part didn't refer to women or slaves or indigenous people or most, even most white men. <laughs> um, you had to own a huge amount of property to even vote. Uh, and you had to e own even more property to be able to hold office. Um, in some states, actually, the property qualifications for holding political office actually increased after the revolution. And so what it ended up being is that only 6% of the population could actually even participate in politics in the first place. And so, okay, only white men who own property uh, could participate in politics after the revolution. Uh, so how would we scientifically describe this, these essential characteristics of the revolution? Well, Marxists would describe it as a bourgeois capitalist revolution, a revolution that was pursued under the leadership and in the interests of the national bourgeoisie. So while the bourgeois assumed the leadership of the revolution and they signed the Declaration of Independence, right? Every person who signed the Declaration of Independence was, of course, a very rich white male property owner. Um, it's not them who actually went in the barricades and fought, did the fighting. It's not them who actually won the revolution. Uh, the revolution uh, was really won due to the massive energy and initiatives of thousands and thousands and thousands of poor people who fought in the revolutionary army uh, and participated in the committee's correspondence. Um, and it was really the initiative of these masses of people which pushed the rich bourgeois to go further and actually pushed them to fight for independence. And in fact, they dish initially did not want to. In 1774, even George Washington and the whole First Continental Congress voted against, <laughs> were, they did, voted not in favor of independence. Um, but, but, you know, before Washington's revolutionary army was organized, the poor farmers and workers actually took revolution into their own hands. They organized guerrilla militias uh, to seize land for themselves, which was occupied by the British. While the British armies, they would march in straight lines, right, and fight properly. Um, the lower classes did not care at all for the formal etiquette of war. They were organized very non-hierarchically. and They would hide in the trees and play dirty. They would ambush their enemies. They'd crush them. Many times they would just totally wipe them out. They didn't play by the rules of their oppressors when they were fighting them. And so these, these were quite effective techniques, but they were lower class techniques, right? And those were not acceptable to the bourgeois leadership of the revolution. Because, you know, you see the most powerful weapon a, revolutionary, a, a revolution has is its ideas, which inspire the masses to, vote their, to devote their lives to the struggle. But George Washington was starting to get concerned. He was like, well, hold on, these ideas of life and liberty pursuit of happiness, you guys are getting a bit carried away now, you know? Like, maybe you're a bit too inspired by this. And so George Washington, he came to reorganize the militias. He forced them to adopt the traditional methods of fighting with hierarchical command structures and this formal marching in straight lines. And what he did, he actually organized, reorganized the revolution to fight in the exact same way 
as a counter-revolution. But this really didn't work. Um, the invigorated revolutionary masses were quite uh, different from the counter-revolutionary army. Um, and so actually, in fact, George Washington lost every single battle in his first three years of, as a general. And the only, except one, the only one he did win was when they attacked and killed a bunch of drunk Chris British soldiers on Christmas. So well done, <laughs> well done, George. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the Borsha leadership, they needed people to fight for them, um, but people were no, not really that invigorated when they weren't going to get the right to vote anyway, and they had to be organized in a way to fight. That kind of sucked. Uh, and so to force people to fight, uh, these great founding fathers of America, the slave owners and uh, rich merchants, they drafted the poor into the army. Um, but you could avoid the draft by paying five pounds, uh, so rich people didn't actually have to join the army. Um, and uh, these soldiers were ruthlessly oppressed by the bourgeois leadership. Um, in fact, uh, they were paid very little, like $6 a month or whatever the equivalent was, uh, while the colonels received $75 um, dollars or shillings, whatever it was, a month. Um, and this new currency uh, that they were issuing was actually worthless anyway, and it was constant inflation, which we know a bit about today. Um, and so not only were the soldiers paid pennies, but they'd even be lucky to actually get their pay <laughs> at all. Uh, many soldiers were just never paid. They were just straight up not paid by the state even after the war was won. Um, and meanwhile, uh, all these soldiers, these many lower class poor soldiers, were living in very harsh conditions. Uh, they died of sickness and froze in the colds. Um, and yeah, uh, Typically, when that happens, like people don't like that. Uh, and so the lower classes in these revolutionary armies who were being so exploited, dying in these harsh conditions, they actually revolted many times against the bourgeois revolutionary leadership. Um, in May of 1779, the first company of Philadelphia artillery, uh, via petition, threatened violence and organized mass gatherings against this rich American merchant named Robert Morris uh, because he was withholding food from the market. On New Year's in 1781, more troops from Pennsylvania revolted. Um, and they got drunk. They beat up their ar officers of the Revolutionary Ar Army. They killed their captain. Um, and they marched on the Continental Congress itself. And Washington, well, he was able to appease them and he by just paying them what they were promised to be paid. Uh, but then when another mutiny happened in New Jersey, Washington executed all their leaders by firing squad and had their friends pull the triggers. Um, and then later, after the Revolutionary Army was disbanded, uh, when Daniel Shea led the famous Shea's Rebellion, uh, where he organized and rallied thousands of farmers into squads to prevent the courts from meeting, because what would happen is the courts would meet and then they would throw all these poor farmers into debtors prisons and they would take their farms. And it was after this event, it was after Shea's Rebellion, where you have that famous quote from Thomas Jefferson, uh, where he says, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is actually a good thing. God forbid we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Um, so yeah, the lower classes were the basis of not only the revolutionary army, not only the revolution as a whole, um, but of course they're also the basis of all the wealth that these rich bourgeois um, possessed in the first place. Um, and yet, despite all this sacrifice, they were not not only not given the right to vote, um, but most of them weren't even paid for it. Um, and even the ones who were lucky enough to get paid had to go into debt anyway because the currency was constantly inflating. And the luckiest of them got land as payment, uh, which I'll get into more in a second. And where did that land come from? Well, it's definitely the case. The British property owners got kind of got the short end of the stick after the revolution against them. Uh, the Continental Congress confiscated about one third of all the property in the country. All of that property belonged to the pro-British loyalists. That's millions and millions of acres of property confiscated in the name of the revolution, and the government refused to compensate these loyalist traders. So, if anyone ever tells you that our program to nationalize the commanding heights of the economy is un-American, or our comrades when they say that in the US, uh, that it won't work, well, you can tell them that actually nationalizing is a, an American tradition, um, that in fact, the United States was founded on the largest land nationalization, one of the largest in history. 
Uh, but, you know, we should always bear in mind, this was a bourgeois revolution. So most of that land was not given to the masses at all. It was sold at state auctions for a tiny fractions of their value, with the proceeds going to the state treasuries. And so what this meant was that rich Americans uh, could just buy large amounts of land for extremely low prices, and then they just get even more rich as a result. Unfortunately, most of those uh, British loyalist traders who had all their land compensated, they all moved up here into Canada. Um, and this kind of plays a big reason why Canada is still tied to Britain and is still a constitutional monarchy. Um, so yes, yeah, some of the land was given as payment to the soldiers, but the bourgeois were very careful about this because they didn't want these guys to be property owners and then they'd start voting and stuff, you know? So uh, whenever the land was given to the soldiers, it was given as a mortgage through a bank and put them into debt. And so many just had to sell their land as a result and got worthless currency uh, due to inflation. Um, so yeah, going into debt, it is an American tradition. Um, when the Revolutionary War was eventually won, it became time to uh, draft a Constitution of the United States of America in 1787. The Constitution was made to protect private property with a strong central government designed to do so. It was drafted by the rich property owners, half of whom were bankers. Um, and, and these bankers um, had so much money lent out, right, as, with interest. So of course they're going to draft a constitution that makes sure they get paid back. Um, and, and this constitution is the basis of the U.S. today. If you th just think about, think about it, if you steal from your boss at work, if you steal stuff from your job, well the boss can call the cops and you'll get arrested and the state will compensate them, say, I'm so sorry you had to go through this, Mr. Businessman. Uh, but if your boss refuses to pay you, can you just call the cops on him? Can you just call the Red Guard and they'll go like beat him up and like give him, get your pay for you? No, you have to go through months of bureaucracy and lawsuits uh, and you won't even be guaranteed to get your pay on time when you have to pay your rent, right? And if your landlord refuses to like fix your house, you can't just call the cops on him, right? Um, Constitution was written to protect the interests of private property, and it's done so ever since. Yet, the Declaration of Independence, which began the revolution like 10 years before, kind of contradicts this, at least in principle. Right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. It continues that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. And so, I mean, is it not the case that the US government has totally become destructive of these ends today? Like, how can we have life if we don't have decent health care? How can we have liberty when we have the largest prisoner population in the world? Uh, how can we pursue happiness if every day a new burden is pressed into our face by the capitalist system? Rent, credit card debt, student loans, shitty health care, shitty car insurance, police violence, wars, constant austerity, right? None of this is aligned with these so-called inalienable rights, nor with the idea that we're all created equal. And so, yeah, it's my view and the view of Fight Back and of our comrades' socialist revolution in the United States that the only justice for America is the justice of a revolution against this disgusting and broadening capitalist system plagued by mass inequality, racism, and violence. That, in fact, it's our right and our responsibility to revolt, that a new American revolution is needed. And, you know, we can discover some of the old some of the old revolutionary traditions. You know, there might be some stuff to learn from the militant activity of the Sons of Liberty. It certainly can learn from nationalizing the property of the rich, um, and even some of the words from the Declaration of Independence itself. But this new revolution has to be fundamentally different, right? It must be a working class mass proletarian revolution. Fortunately, there is a science of the revolutionary move, uh, methods that the working class uses to fight and overthrow capitalism. That science is called Marxism. And also fortunately, there is an idea of a system that can replace capitalism, and that's called communism. Uh, in fact, if you read this wonderful paper, you'll see that 20% of American youth actually want communism. Tens of millions Millions of young Americans are looking for revolutionary ideas to overthrow this rotten capitalist system. And one million Canadians as well, they believe that communism is the ideal economic system.
So really, it's only the methods of, of, of Marxism um, that, can, that can guide us to a future where the lives of millions are not determined by the greed of a handful of billionaires, but where the working people of the world as a whole can own and direct the economy in the interests of the world as a whole. And that's toward communism. And so in a certain sense, to tie it all back together, we kind of do have to steal the Declaration of Independence like Nick Cage does in National Treasure. <laughs> but but, but, but that, what I mean by that is we have to overthrow the state. Um, and, and in a certain sense too, there is like a treasure buried under Wall Street, but that's capital. That's all the capital, all this wealth of society that we've produced, that the working class has produced, that's locked up by the, these people. And it's our responsibility to seize it and make a better world. So thanks everyone.